Good morning, I am Dennis Schmidt, the pastor of Dubuque Community Church, and the title of today's message is Life Changing Moments. You know, one of the many blessings that come from us for, for us and for those around us when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior is that it changes us. It changes our whole future, and it changes us for the better, and it changes uh, our interaction with other people also for the better. And we're going to look at one of these occasions today uh, as we're looking at life changing moments. If you see the screen there, that's what the screen says, life changing moments. And if you can see the paths there, there's two paths there. And uh, you know, every day we're making a choice uh, which, which way we're going to go and uh, we're going to make those uh, changes in our life. And uh, uh, every day, every decision you make, you can turn to the left or you can turn to the right and it'll affect the whole rest of your future of your life. Well, I believe in our hearts today that all of our hearts are broken by the needless war that's going on in the Ukraine. I, I should say seemingly useless or needless war. I don't know all the facts. I'm not right there. I only know what I hear <clears throat> in the media. And it looks like, again, I'll say it looks like that the president of Russia, who's already a billionaire and has a luxurious mansion and large yachts and other things, thought it would decide it was worth killing a lot of innocent people, including his own innocent troops, uh, for what he called uh, adding to the safety of his Russian empire. Uh, he said it was a defensive measure. And, uh, but there is no sign that Ukraine in any way wanted to attack Russia. But again, I don't know all the answers here. But it, it looks like a, an unnecessary attack. <clears throat> and it could be that it is, the roots of this whole thing is in sins of pride of human being and it's bedfellow greed. When you're proud, you, you think you need more and more and more. And many times you'll start to take it from other people when you're too proud. So we're going to see today, and uh, as we're, everybody's getting more and more concerned about the war, uh, I heard a, 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 an angry <laughs> news commentator, and I also heard a prominent center, senator, both calling for some of Putin's ruling class to take out Putin. Well, I think they were trying to say it in a nice way, but I believe they were abstractly calling for the assassination of Pre uh, Putin, the president of Russia. Well, I caught myself briefly caught up in the moment in agreement with them. Uh, for after all, wouldn't it be better for one person uh, to die than for all of these other innocent people who are being killed? But then I remembered an in incident that we're going to discuss a little bit today uh, it, it, when Jesus was traveling through Samaria. Well, if you knew, know about the Samaritans, they were half Assyrian and half Jewish, and there was a constant war going on between the Samaritans and the Jewish people. They hated each other, and that's very sad. But in Luke 9, 52, 53, where I'm going to say what, what challenged me today, is Jesus had sent some messengers ahead uh, into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. Uh, but it said, but the people did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. They, they did not want nothing, anything to do with these Jewish people when they're heading for Jerusalem. Well, and this is where we come. And when uh, Luke 9, 54 through 56, and when his disciples, Jesus' disciples, James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did. Well, his disciples, followers, hand-picked followers of Jesus, said, should we destroy them? Should we kill them? Uh, uh, you know, I, I say this is really overkill here, and there's a pun intended there, overkill, to kill them because they would not receive them. They said, like Elijah did. And if you know your Old Testament Bible, you know that at one time uh, there was a man named Elijah and the ungodly king of the northern kingdom of Israel, he sent a troop, of fo a force of soldiers to go down to Elijah's house to tell him, come on up here, I want to talk to you. 
Well, in 2 Kings 1, 9 and 10, if you want to look at it there, it's not on the screen. Uh, then he sent Elijah a captain with 50 men to go down and to force Elijah to come up to where he was at. Well, when the guy comes, there's Elijah sitting on the hilltop all by himself. And, it, and the, the, the commander says, man of God, come on down. Well, Elijah responds to the captain, If I'm a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And the Bible says that immediately fire left heaven and came down and consumed all 51 of the men. And that's what the disciples were talking about. But, this is, but and here's, where, here's the part where we need to recognize. But he, Jesus... So speaking to his disciples, turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are. In other words, he's scolding them and saying, You do not understand what I have come to do. He said, For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Well, as he calls himself the son of man, that might sound like he's trying to be humble. But if you know, and maybe you've heard this from me before in Daniel 7, 13, uh, when he's saying, I am the son of man, uh, Daniel, the great prophet who had lived um, uh, 400 years before uh, the birth of Jesus, had talked about a Messiah coming, a, and he said he will be a son of man, and he will come with the clouds of heaven. And uh, it talks about in verse 14, he will be given authority and glory and sovereign power and all, every nation will worship him. So Jesus was clearly claiming to be the Messiah right here. And uh, even if you think about it a little bit, when the high priest was interrogating Jesus then he said, are you really the Christ, the Son of God? And this is Mark, Mark 14, 61. Jesus says, I am. I am him. I am the Messiah. And you will see the Son of Man on the, seated at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. He was referencing Daniel 7, 13 through 14 as well. He was saying, I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. Well, because of that, Jesus had the authority to literally bring uh, destruction down on the Samaritans, but instead of wanting to destroy them, he wanted to, and that's what the last part of the verse, he doesn't come to destroy, he comes to save, praise God, and he said, let's go to another village, which I think was a very appropriate decision to make. And here's an important note. Later on, those Samaritans who had received God's grace later did, and many of them did come and were saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what God wants. He does not want killing and murder. He wants salvation. And you know, I am so glad that God did not destroy me when I was living contrary to the holy laws. Uh, earlier on in my life, God could have taken my life, could have destroyed me and sent me to hell, and he'd had every reason to do so because uh, I was not thinking about the kingdom of God. And, uh, and I'm so glad for that grace. And if you really understood uh, what your sin is like with God, you'd be glad, too, that God is restraining his hand. And I am ashamed to think of how many times I've thought when I've heard C Christians or other innocent people being killed uh, that my first re response was, well, we need to kill them first before they kill any more people. And uh, I guess I can blame it a little bit on my army training, and my, uh, but more so on my human thinking, not biblical thinking, because when you really think like God thinks, your first thought isn't we need to kill them before they kill somebody else. Well, you know, and when I would have these thoughts, and I can tell you very clearly, I would have these thoughts, and the Holy Spirit, I could feel the Spirit of God being grieved inside my heart, a grieving, and then I would even begin to argue with the Holy Spirit and say, "Well, what do we got? What, what can we do? We can't let these guys keep on killing innocent people." Well, as usual, 
whenever we think uh, we, we don't have the right, or when we don't have the right answer, God does have the right answer if we take time and wait for it. And one of the things that he put in my heart is, we don't need to kill these people, we need to pray for them to repent and turn from their sin. And that's one of our greatest weapons. It's not stealth bombers, it's not unmanned drones, it's not all these weapons of the world that carnal men think of, it is prayer. So when there's something going on like this, we need to be praying, not for the destruction of the leaders, but for them to repent and turn from what they're doing. Prayer will change a heart. Prayer will turn you around 180 degrees, and the Bible talks a lot about making this heart change. It's called repentance. And uh, it's going to tell, it tells us a lot about the heart of God when we see, uh, it's in first P, or Second Peter here, 3, 9. And it tells us this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some people understand slowness. He is patient with you. Aren't you glad God is patient with you? Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God will give us time to repent because he does not want us to be eternally separated from him. So let's just see this repentance. Let's see this change of heart. Let's see what God can do in a, in a very short time, very quickly, to change people and turn them around. Well, today we're going to look at a man named Paul, or his name is Saul. Paul was his... Uh, uh, Roman name. Uh, Saul was his Jewish name. It was not unusual at all for uh, people in that time to have two different names. Uh, one would be their Roman name and the other one would be the country they're from, and in this case, Jewish. Well, Saul, or Paul, whichever one you want to call him, was living in demonic darkness. He was listening to the devil, and it was going to take God to really get his attention and uh, to, to really knock him to the ground, literally, before he was going to listen to what God had to say to him. Well, today we're going to go forward and we're going to look what Paul had to say in his own words in the book of Acts in chapter 28. Paul here, as we go to the next slide, is giving his defense in a court hearing before King Agrippa. And uh, so he is going to tell him, what happened to him that made him so different from the person that the, he was a leader to the one they were trying to kill. Acts 2, 26, 9 through 8, uh, 9 to 18, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Paul was completely sure that the Christians, what they were doing was wrong and, uh, and that he was right. And I believe probably if you ask President Putin, he'd believe the same thing, although he may be misled as well. And because he believed it with all his heart, this is the right thing to do. That says to do all that was possible to oppose them. So uh, Paul and maybe Putin, I don't know, I can't look into his heart, maybe in good conscience, they are doing what they think is necessary for the good of hopefully the Russian and Ukrainian people, I don't know. No one can look into a man's heart. Only God can do that. But in this case, Paul is trying to stop the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And you know, Paul at this point is being used as a pawn of the devil, and we need to know that too, that sometimes when people are doing wicked things, they're just listening to the devil. They're not listening to God. And the devil knows that the power, the power that's in the name of Jesus, and that's a whole other message for another time. But, and so because he believed it with all his heart, there in the next verse it says, and that is just what I did. He's, this is his own testimony in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the saints in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Well, the priests were losing their power, and they only had one answer, and that was kill them. <laughs> and this is the, 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 the idea they came up with for Jesus. Let's kill him. Now we got these other people that are speaking in the name of Jesus. Let's kill them. 
Uh, Putin may be saying, you know what, we got to stop what's going on in the Ukraine. Let's kill them. We'll kill them until they change their mind. So it's kind of a worldly mindset, uh, not to pray for people, but to kill them. Well, he goes on with his own personal testimony and said, Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. Well, Paul is saying this is not an isolated incident. He did it over and over again, and he said, I tried to force them to blaspheme. He tried to re cause them to renounce their faith in Jesus. And you know, President Putin, he's trying to force the Ukrainians to give him control of their country, uh, to give unconditional surrender or die. Um, and he said, in my obsession against them, and see, this is what's wonderful. Paul, at this point, his eyes has been open, and he said, my obsession against them, uh, an unwarranted fixation on destroying them and trying to control someone else's life is what's going on here. He said, I went to persecute them. And Putin even said he's going to destroy every city in Ukraine until they capitulate. Uh, so, you know, we can see this parallel between the two, I believe. Well, getting back to Paul, it says then one day, and here's where the change is. He's about ready to come to the V in the road. And it said, on one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and, and commission of the chief priest. Well, it was one of those days that looked like business as usual. He's going to kill some more Christians today, put a few more in prison. I, so now Paul was not just happy with destroying the people in Jerusalem. He's got to go clear to Damascus. It's 135 miles away. You know, uh, again, just don't want to keep beating the drum with Putin, but, you know, it, there's a question. Will Putin stop in Ukraine if he is successful there, or will he go further? Will he uh, have to go to the next place? Here's Paul. He's cleaned out Jerusalem, so now he's got to go to Damascus, 135 miles away. By the way, that he didn't drive a car over there. He, rode, he either rode a horse or walked, so that's a pretty good trip. Uh, but the good thing is that Paul's worldview, that, 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 that life-changing moment is about to come. And it's all because of that encounter, encounter with that Son of Man that we talked about, this, this uh, Messiah, this one that was prophesied by Daniel to come. And here he goes, he's talking about what happened. He said, about noon, O king, uh, I was in the, uh, on the road. He's on his way to kill some more Christians. I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my compassion. Well, he knew it was about noon. And by the way, if you have an encounter with Jesus Christ, you'll know when it was too. You might know it, not know exact date, but you will remember it. And he saw a bright light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me. Well, if you ever have the privilege of going to the Middle East like I have, you'll realize how much hotter the sun is there than here. Uh, the, uh, Israel is very close to the equator, and because of that, the sun really beats down on them during the day. But yet, this light is brighter than the brightness of the brightness of the sun. So anyway, and then it says, and when that light hit him, it says, We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me, and to me, that that voice is speaking to Paul. He's saying, Saul, Saul, why did you persecute me? It's hard for you to kick against the goad. Well, this light was so bright, it literally knocked <laughs> Paul down. I don't know that I've ever, that no one knows lights that knocks people to the ground, but he's saying, Why do you persecute me? He fell to the ground, he heard him saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Notice one thing here, though. If you probably would have think that there was one person who had the hardest heart in the group, it probably would have been Saul, and yet he is the one that Jesus is coming to and speaking to him personally, calling him by his own name and saying, why are you persecuting me? And I guess the other thing to notice is, here Paul is, he's persecuting Christians, but Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? God takes his children's persecution very personal. And then he says something that we probably don't understand very well, but they would have understood very well in those days. And he says, why are you kicking against the goads? 
Well, back in those days, people would be, they would be uh, plowing and other things with animals, and they would have a little stick with a sharp tip on the end. And when they wanted to get the animal moving a little better or something, they'd give them a little, they'd push it in them a little bit, and the animal would move a little faster. Well, once in a while, the animal would get a little upset about him <laughs> pricking them with this stick, and they would kick back, and they would literally end up pu putting, pushing the point into their leg. And the main essence of the point is, why are you rebelling against me? You're only going to suffer more if you do. So, well, so then goes on to say, then I asked, who are you, Lord? Although Paul at this point didn't know exactly who this was, it was clear to him that this being was much more powerful than him. So he called him Lord. And the, I, I'm sure the answer had to shock Paul. He says, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. Jesus, the very name that Paul was trying to extinguish. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. Well, God, Jesus appointed him to be a servant of God. And you know the day you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you literally are appointed to the same thing, to be a servant, to serve God and not your own flesh, and to be a witness, uh, one who gives testimony of something they've seen and experienced. And by the way, that's exactly what Paul is doing to King Agrippa right now. He's witnessing to him how his conversion story. And you can do the same with other people around you. And when, G uh, when Paul came into that experience with Jesus Christ, he was immediately converted from a foe of Jesus Christ to an avid, avid follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so what, what uh, the Lord's about to say to Paul also is very true for each and every one of us. As we, as we have our meeting with God, as we begin to live for God and not for self, uh, we um, are immediately appointed to a ministry and we begin to be witnesses of the kingdom of God. So then it says, here's what God told him. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them. Well, he says, I'm going to rescue you. Well, here's the important point. Before he was doing the, the work of these people. And now when he quits killing Christians, they want to kill him. So now God is going to have to rescue him and protect him from his own people, the, own, the same people that he knew before. And by the way, if you become a Christian and you begin to really change your life, one of the things you're going to see is you are going to start to meet resistance from other people who used to be your good friends and love you and everything, they're going to say, you really changed. There's something different about you. I don't know if I like this new change. And you try to tell them about Jesus and you invite them to church, uh, all kinds of things will really begin to change between your relationship with them. But then he also told him to Paul, I am going to send you to the Gentiles to reach them. And by the way, the Gentiles were the most unreached people back then. And that's what God does for us, too. Uh, you need to recognize that you will be able to reach some people that, that I'll never be able to reach. There'll be people that'll listen to you, that they know you, and, they, and you'll be able to reach them, but they'll never stop and listen to a message on TV or on video or come to church. Uh, they, they need you to go to them, and that's what God is saying he's doing to Paul. And then he says, to open their eyes. I'm sending you to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that you may receive forgiveness of sin and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So he said, I'm going to, you're going to, they're going to, I'm going to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. You know, one of the things people don't recognize is people say, well, I don't want to follow God, but I don't want to follow devil, the devil. If you're not giving your life to God, you are following the devil. And that's why the devil, he's, he's, a, he's a, the one that fights against God all the way, and he is fighting all the time through people. 
But it says, and then two important things. It says, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins. One of the wonderful gifts that comes when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior is all our sins are forgiven. And it says, and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Well, we receive that complete and total forgiveness, and that is a, a situa something that happens right at that moment. The minute we open up our life to Jesus Christ, as Paul did, and we can call him Lord, and we begin to obey him, uh, we at that moment are declared righteousness, and uh, it's not by any effort or anything, and there's whole other messages about that, uh, not, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his mercy he saved us. So immediately we are completely forgiven. But then the last part of it there says, and sanctified by faith in me. And this is an important part. They are two different things, but they, they both get us ready for heaven, but they're different. Sanctified by me is a process. The other, the, the first one, the, the, to be forgiven, is an event. The be sanctified is a process of many events where you continually learn to live to be more and more like Jesus every day. And by the way, it does also involve some effort on your part to make decisions, to read your Bible, to go to church, to pray, and all these things will make you more and more like Jesus Christ every day. Uh, salvation is a gift from God to you, and you to be sanctified is, and to become more like Jesus is your, part of your gift back to God. So we need to seek that. We need to seek holiness. We see, need to seek God. And, uh, and here's that life-changing moment. You know, in the, in the beginning of the message, we talked about President Putin uh, who under control others, and we talked about Paul doing, doing, uh, trying to force his will on others, and uh, they, they were living in darkness, but until they found God, then they realized what they really need to do. And uh, we need to make sure that we're not thinking like the world, we're not thinking, oh, take them out, kill them, destroy them. Uh, that's carnal thinking. Uh, if you've ever had a conversion experience, you know how much you can change, how your life can change when God comes into your life. We need to be seriously, sincerely praying for the president of Russia. How about the president of the United States? How about our Congress? How about everybody who's making all these decisions that are going to affect all of our lives? We need to be praying for them to, make, to, to have this life changing moment. So I just pray today that you will be praying uh, sincerely for everyone around you. And the greatest prayer is just say, Lord Jesus, save me. Well, God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.